Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of borders, language, culture, and here he is, winner of the National Radio Hall of Fame Award, Michael Savage. You're that golden angel that God is using for this day of time. So no fear, no drama, and today's Michael's best day. Yeah. Well, you're not going to believe this story. Welcome to the Savage Nation. God speaks to us in very strange ways, doesn't he? Many people look for God, and of course, the more you look for things, you can't find them, whether it's romance or God, or dollars, or this or that. I've been told that since I was a child. The more you look for something, the more it retreats. Well, I stopped looking for God. I'm not saying God spoke to me today, but I will tell you this story. Welcome to the show, by the way. Yes, I'll do the news. Yes, the word Trump will come up. Yes, the word liberal will come up, maybe. Yes, the word media will come up. CNN will not come up unless it comes up on you. So let me tell you the story. It's an important one. It's summertime. Give me a break. Now, I was going to open the show by reading my horoscope, which says you can tell people what they want to hear today if you so choose, but it won't do them any favors. Today's lunar eclipse means that certain individuals need a dose of reality in their lives, so be blunt and call it as you see it. And I was going to go on the air and say, attention, President Trump, I know you're on vacation. I know you're in your house up in New Jersey. I know you're probably bored to death. Let's hope not the last part of that sentence. Uh, I know you're bored up there. You're probably listening to me on WABC 770 on the dial. What else is there to do right now, President Trump? And I was going to say, President Trump, how come you don't come on national talk radio? Even your popularity numbers are, are so down by any analysis. And you say your base is still with you, yet you won't talk to your base. You go out and you do your appearances in stadiums and you go home, and that's fine. But it was not the stadium appearances per se that got you where you are. It was the base on the radio. And not just Michael Savage. You don't go on any radio show. Who's advising that? But I'm not going to talk about that. I was going to ask you, do you agree or disagree with privatizing the war in Afghanistan? But we're not going to talk about that yet. Instead, let me tell you what happened on my bicycle. I go on my bicycle ride this morning, and as I'm zipping by, there's, I'm very sensitive to noises. I don't like noise of any kind, for whatever the reason. I'm just, I like isolation and quietude. I guess that means I have a mental illness, because I don't like noise. See, I guess if you were a normal person, you would like noise and stinks and loud lights in your eyes, but I'm not like that. I like clean air, and I like fresh water, and clean food, and quiet people. I'm the only one who's allowed to be loud, but nevertheless, I'm taking my, my morning little ride, and I hear a very loud vacuum machine running in the street. So naturally, I, I, my head turns to it as I'm on the bike, and there's this big black guy vacuuming a car. I say, oh, there's Dave. I knew Dave for years. He's a car detailer. He also happens to be a pastor in a local church. And I've, once in a while, I made, gave him some money for turkeys. But I run into him so seldom once every few years. So all of a sudden, he stops me, and he comes over and, love you, brother, you know, that kind of thing. This guy's like 300 pounds, big guy. And one word leads to the other, and he starts telling me this story and that story. He says, well, uh, I told him, you know, he, he brought it up. I didn't bring it up. He brought up the incident from last February when that uh, altercation occurred in the streets. He said, well, we've been praying for you, brother, if you need anything. I said, don't worry about it. I said, it was God's hand. It's all over with. Don't worry about it. So he told me about a story about an Iranian-looking guy who bugged him. And uh, this guy's a big black guy. He's no small guy. And then the Iranian guy, for some reason, put his hand on him. And he said to him, listen to me, brother. You put your hands on me again. I'm going to take off my pasta clothing. And you're not going to be very happy. And he said, the guy ran away. I said, that's a great story, Dave. So we're talking about this and about that. You know, great guy, loves to talk and tell me, tell me his stories about his ministry over there in Mill Valley. And he says to me, well, he said, I got to tell you something, Michael. He said, I was in this neighborhood. This is an all lily white neighborhood that I have a little house in. And he said, I was outside in the street waxing a car just this morning. And a woman comes down the steps and says to me, what are you doing here? I said, what? In, in this lily white liberal community, she said to you, a black man, what are you doing here? And he said, yes. I said, in this liberal community? 
He said, Michael, you don't know what we black people go through. I said, even in this liberal community, she said, what are you doing here? He said, they're not liberal. He said, they just pretend to be liberal, Michael. He says, you speak the truth. He says, they're liars, every last one of them. He says, don't you know, brother, why we listen to you? He says, my mother loves you. My father-in-law loves you. My father loves you. All of my ministry loves you. I said, wow, that's powerful stuff. He said, just remember, Michael. He said, you have a big calling, and don't ever forget that. I said, well, look, Dave, I said, I pray for my health every day. I said, that's all I pray for. He said, well, keep on praying. He said, God's listening to you. Just a little tiny story. Now, why is that an important story? Answer, it isn't. But it's significant in my life. And unless I bring you the significance in my life, uh, I'm not bringing you the significance of my analysis, my truths, as I see them. And so what this is connected to is very odd. Only 30 minutes before that, my publisher finally sent me the new book cover, the final book cover to God, Faith, and Reason. I'm not going to talk about it because it's too many months away. It comes out in November. But I finally got the book cover, and it was put up on Amazon. I don't even want you to go look at it yet because it's too soon. But 20, 30 minutes later, I run into Dave, and he starts talking to me about God. And as I said to you, God speaks in strange ways. You've got to understand, all of you out there who have given up believing in anything other than yourself uh, and HBO, there's much more than Katzenberg, Hatzenberg, Matzenberg, Ratzenberg and the imagery they put out to the world. Believe me, there's a lot more in the world than the vile imagery that comes out of Hollywood. And yet that has replaced virtually everything in our minds, hasn't it? Except maybe what's on Instagram or Twitter. I guess that's even more powerful than the Bible itself. But um, I haven't forgotten. I guess in that sense, a part of me is still stuck in the old, in the old world. I haven't forgotten any of that. It's still in me, and I know that there's an answer to it all. I don't know the answer to it all, but I know there is an answer to it all, see? That's the point. Well, that's the opening to the show. And I want you to send a donation to Dave. He does such good work. It goes right to him. I put it up on my Twitter feed. I put a picture of him up reading that. I mean, just saying that to me. He actually told me a biblical story before it about Abraham and the child and Hagar, I mean, he's very well versed in the, in the Bible. So I said, well, let me put you up on Twitter. Big God Ministries with a postal box, big, biggodministries.com. Send him money. He gives turkeys out on Thanksgiving. So help him give out some turkeys on Thanksgiving. Well, that's the opening to the show. Now let's get down to business. If that's not business, I don't know what is. Yesterday I talked about the intersection between entertainment and politics and said that we have a president who certainly represents that uh, as uh, for the second time in our near history. Ronald Reagan was the first man who showed the intersection between entertainment and politics. And I was talking about the sad, self-deprecating filth that passes for humor today. And I was reading an article today on page six by Cindy Adams about Melissa Rivers holding nothing back in a book about her mom. And some of these one-liners from Joan Rivers were so funny because they're self-deprecating but not vile like today's non-comedians, non-comics, you get it? So the book has some child insecurities where the parents hated me jokes such as, I was born ugly. After the doctor slapped me, the nurses took a shot. My first birthday present was luggage. Bath toys, she said. They gave me a toaster and a radio. That's a hilarious line. I don't know who wrote that one. My childhood memory was them loosening the wheels on my... (laughs) I can't even read it. It's very funny. My childhood memory was them loosening the wheels on my stroller. <laughs> Come on. Even even the most horrendously cynical person has to laugh at that one. When I wet the bed, my mother bought me an electric blanket. <laughs> Come on. They take me to the subway and throw candy bars <laughs> on the tracks. This woman was certifiably funny, but the point is they're self-deprecating all you young, stupid drug addicts who think you're comedians but there are no filthy, dirty, vile words. She didn't have to go into the sexual gutter to get a laugh out of the dumb audiences you appear before. Just because the sickos at HBO want you to become a degenerate doesn't mean you have to. Uh, Anyway, that was the opening. And then on page six today, Cindy Adams writes about this smug idiot Colbert, who I always thought was a nobody, but she did it best. She said, a word about CBS's late night big mouth, S for smug Colbert. On his behind, sinking in ratings, low level nowhere, until he began smacking President Trump. Easy to leak body fluid on a VIP. 
Smart A, nasty is the grown version of a high school bully. Teenagers then hung around laughing. Grown-ups now hang around laughing. He's doing small-time stand-up sitting down. It's old-school, old-hat, old-time Don Rickles stuff. Call someone a hockey puck takes no talent. Just comedy writers. Can anyone imagine any other country allowing this? And she's talking about that talentless piece of garbage, Colbert, who has only got ratings because he bashes Trump, along with that other talentless hack. You know who I'm talking about. And trust me on that. Uh, mad Macho Radcow. I mean, Macho Radcow is a fifth-rate nobody, and the only reason she has big ratings is because the feminazis destroy Trump, and they're going after every man with a heart and a soul on Fox News. So the only thing left is someone who would like to be a man on MSNBC or acts like a bad man. Let's put it. Th- let's put it. Yeah, someone who acts like a vile, low-class man on MSNBC. Does that work for you? I don't think Dave would approve of that. Because Dave has love in his heart. Dave, that's the difference between you and I. I don't. Uh, that's the opening to the show. 855 407 There are many other topics. I know many of you are speechless by this opening because it's not like, well, I got to tell you, them liberals, uh, it's, the, it's them liberals in the media that's no good. But it's us guys with private jets who, uh, we're the good ones. Uh, we're, we're the good, uh, we're the guys who pay no taxes, but... Uh, well, we, we own slum housing, 18,000 units of slum housing, but uh, we're against the government, even though we get uh, Section 8 money from the government. <laughs> is that what you want to hear? You're on the wrong station. This is the Savage Nation station. Be here or be nowhere. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. That's the story. God speaks in strange ways, or it was said another way. God sees the truth but waits. You can tell people what they want to hear today if you so choose, but it won't do them any favors. Today's lunar eclipse means that certain individuals need a dose of reality in life, so be blunt and call it as you see it. I've also put up the topic of President Trump. I'm going to ask you this question. I'm going to turn it over to my audience. We're going to make it a national news story from the show called The Father of Trumpomania, in Salon Magazine, which is the opposition party, in essence. I'm asking, why won't Trump come on national talk radio as his popularity plummets? What do you think? Who is keeping Donald Trump off of talk radio? I believe that's as valid a topic as any for talk radio. I mean, we're not a marginal operation. We're bigger than cable news. We have bigger audiences than cable news. Everyone knows that in the media. My AQH is bigger than what they they get uh, on television on these channels. Yet he won't come on any shows anymore. Why? Who do you think is keeping Donald Trump away from talk radio? Don't you think he should talk to you, the Eddies and the Ediths who put him where he is? Shouldn't he come out and say thank you and tell you what he's going to do for the country? Moreover, tell us the good work he's already done because there are many good things happening. Why won't Trump come on national talk radio while his popularity is plummeting? After all, we pushed him over the finish line. Say, well, no, you didn't do it. Forget, okay, I didn't do it. Who else did it? Let him go on the shows that did it then. He won't go on any show. He won't go on any show. So somebody's advising him not to go on radio. I don't know why. I never set the guy up. So anyway, here are some other stories that I was going to get to. It's time to stop spending taxpayer dollars on Elon Musk and cronyism. That was a phenomenal story in the Daily Signal yesterday. Half of this phony's billion-dollar fortune comes from you the taxpayer did you hear this he put together a company called solar city run by his cousins linden and peter reeve and the company is going bankrupt and during his chairmanship at solar city ellen musk's family took in billions of taxpayer dollars and subsidies from both the federal and local governments but these deals were not enough as losses and losses and missed projections continued to mount So rather than endure the embarrassment of collapse and further damage to the public image of Musk and Tesla, the cousins conspired, are you listening? 
to have Tesla simply purchase Solar City this year. So you're going to now bail out one of this guy's companies that's bankrupt. Why? Why is he getting all these billions of dollars? Well, the Senate Finance Committee and the House Ways and Means Committee have launched a probe into tax incentives paid to solar companies. That would include not only Elon Musk's companies, I would also think it would be some very famous Congress people's family solar-related companies here in the Bay Area. That's a topic that you can't talk about. Agree or disagree, Trump, White House, weighs unprecedented plan to privatize much of the war in Afghanistan. I almost fell out of my chair. Trump is now going to privatize it? The White House is actively considering a bold plan to turn over a big chunk of the war in Afghanistan to private contractors in an effort to turn the tide in a stalemated war? According to the former head of a security firm pushing the project. That's from uh, Blackwater. Now, let me ask you a question. If we're not winning in Afghanistan, why not just pull all of our troops out and let the Taliban take over the country? Why are we there at all? And if a giant nation like Britain got smashed in Afghanistan, I think read the charge of the Light Brigade, I believe it was at a battle that they lost in uh, Afghanistan back in the 1800s. The Russians, you remember the pictures of those great Russian helicopters being shot down? Uh, by sting by the Afghani rebels who we supported with stinger missiles it was our technology that shot down the Russian helicopters So now we're getting shot down in Afghanistan Why are we even there? Why are we there 16 years in Afghanistan and we're still there? So I disagree with putting privatization at work in Afghanistan because I've long joked on this radio program that one day we're liable to wake up under Obama and find out that he privatized the U.S. military, and we'll have Chinese troops wearing American uniforms telling us it's better for America because they can do it for less. They work for a dollar a day. Well, to me, this sounds very much like that. No, I'm opposed to privatizing any portion of the U.S. military because the U.S. military is called the U.S. military for a reason. And if it is not in the national interest to be there, then we shouldn't be there at all. That's another topic. This is the Savage Nation. I got 10 others, if those are not good enough. Can a child as young as four really know their sexual orientation? Should these sexual activists be stopped by creating a transgender camp for children as young as four years old in the sick San Francisco Bay Area? Of course! Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE-SAVAGE. the savage nation 34 minutes after the hour across america we're talking about numerous topics and I, I can't repeat them every time i come back from a break so i'm going to let you repeat them by responding to some of them i haven't gotten into the other issues that i want to get into but i'm not going to load up where we're overwhelmed i mean i brought up the privatization of the war in afghanistan which i totally disagree with i have no idea why the white house would consider privatizing the war in afghanistan to private contractors I cannot understand the shocking idea. It's an amazing story. Uh, One of the amazing parts is that it's an admission that we can't win. Now, why can't the U.S. military win in Afghanistan? Well, if the U.S. military, with all of its powers, can't win in Afghanistan, how a private contractor is going to win in Afghanistan? The only only answer is uh, that private contractors will be able to do things that the U.S. military cannot do, owing to rules of engagement put in to cripple them by Barry uh, Hussein Obama. But who is behind this? General Mattis and General McMaster were supposed to be calling uh, the actions of the military. But we hear they're against this plan. We hear that Steve Bannon is for privatization. Steve Bannon is now running the military? This is an idea proposed by Blackwater Security founder Eric Prince. They were used to protect diplomats in Iraq during the war and also hired to help with support and supplies. But this idea is actually farming out the war to a private firm. I'm aware that hired guns is not brand new. I understand that. I know about the Flying Tigers in World War II. I know about the Hessians in the Revolutionary War. I know all about it. 
Believe me, I've studied my history on privatization. But this is a little odd. I know that civilian contractors have assisted the military for hundreds of years. But now to become the, the military itself and encroach on traditional combat duties? This is odd, very odd indeed. If we look back on the history of mercenaries, we see that it didn't turn out very well. When we turned to hired guns in the 1980s to fight the Soviets in Afghanistan, we inadvertently created Osama bin Laden. You see, when you pay someone to fight a war against another country, can another country not pay that same person, that same person or persons to fight you? When you hire a gun, you do just that. You don't count on loyalty or love of country. You just count on the job being done. Is this the one thing the free market shouldn't be involved in? Or is this the future of war? And what will happen if this becomes the norm? Hmm. Big questions out there. But the main question that I really want to talk about today is why Donald Trump will not come on any talk radio show. It's not about Michael complaining about him not coming on here. He, will, he has not done any talk radio, so far as any of us know, since he was elected. People are keeping him away from you, the Eddies and the Ediths who put him in power. So I ask you, the listener, in the middle of this beautiful summer day, why won't Trump come on national talk radio while his popularity is plummeting? And everyone admits his popularity is plummeting. Even favorable polls, favorable polls, such as Quinnipiac, I'm one of the few people in the world who can pronounce it. Why they still call it Quinnipiac, I'll never understand. That tribe is uh, a certainly a noble tribe, but they could name it something else like Westchester County Poll or something. Nevertheless, Quinnipiac, which is a uh, hippiac, whippiac, nippiap, kippiap, giddyap poll, which is generally favorable to him, even yippiap, quinnipiac, quinnipiac says his, po- his popularity is falling. Why won't he come on, Kevin, on WBOB <coughs> Radio in Jacksonville, Florida? You are the first caller to the great savage nation today. What's the reason in your mind? Uh, I-, I think it's he's just isolated. I think the deep state just has their tentacles wrapped around him, and I think Trump, being a businessman, wants to see the good in everyone, and he's trying to figure out who he can and cannot trust. And wait, 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 wait. You're going a feel Slow down. The deep state, which is trying to get rid of him, they're the ones advising him not to come on talk radio? Is that what you're saying? Uh, I, I, I don't think it's necessarily that. I think it's the fact that he, he doesn't know who he can and cannot trust. Um, I think- wait, wait, wait. Slow down. What do you mean? Cannot trust where? In talk radio? Yeah, as far as talk radio goes, I, another thing is I think that... Yeah, sorry, wait a minute. You're going all over the map. It's a simple question. Why won't Trump come on talk radio, national talk radio, which is what drove him over the finish line? We were with him from the beginning, not just this show, but others. He has not done talk radio. He's obsessed with cable television, which has a much smaller audience. Do you have any idea why? No. no. I, Next to the call. Of course you don't. But it's nice that you tried. I understand they give you a, a few minutes uh, a day out of the room there over there in the facility, and you get to the pay phone and you make a call to talk radio. It's not bad. It's a part of therapy. Why not? Why not? All right, let's have some fun. Moonbeam, General Moonbeam, better known as Governor Jerry Brown. Uh, here's a guy who's building a train to nowhere. Here's a guy who's diverting all the water out of the Delta in order to feed the 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 insatiable desire for water to make L.A. bigger and starve the farmers where this once great agricultural state will die if he, le- if he doesn't stop. Here is Jerry Brown on climate change in 01. In terms of climate change, it is an existential threat. Uh, it is not a hoax. It was not created in China. It is something that the uh, major- majority, 95% of global oh, of scientists uh, believe oh. in, 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 this, in the science believe of climate change. We've got to do it. something. It's, it is life-threatening uh, oh, over a relatively foreseeable uh, amount of time. They're all becoming senile. They're slow. They really are. They're like in rocking chairs. Him, Pelosi, Waters. The entire Democrat establishment are in mental rocking chairs. He said so many things that were wrong in that statement. Where shall I begin? It's not a hoax. It was not created in China. It's something that the majority, 95% of scientists, I guess it used to be 98%. Now it's 95%. Well, at least they're moving down a little bit. Uh, The latest thing I read from a real scientist as opposed to a fake politician uh, tells us that 
we all know it's a hoax. Now, this is not to argue that we want a dirty environment, Jerry. Jerry Brown, listen to me. I've worked, I've got my bona fides in, in conservation going back 40 years, both in my writings of books and in my research and my travels. I've done more than you've done, Jerry, and certainly more than Al Gorleone has done. And I will tell you objectively that the evidence, if you want evidence and you want to talk about science, not feelings, and not quoting data that can be fudged one way or the other, let's look at reality. Jerry, please look at the reality. In two books ago, I wrote a chapter in um, Government Zero, I believe it's in, about a thing called the Vostok ice core samples. I keep going back to them because it's hard evidence, the Vostok ice core samples, Jerry. And I know your 95% of scientists are all government paid research hacks. And if Donald Trump would have put me in charge of the NSF or the NIH, I would unfund all of them. I defund all of them and they go to work for you in the state of California putting out their big lies. I would save the government billions of dollars by defunding all of their fake research. You see, Mr. Brown, there's some very inconvenient research out there. Maybe up there in Sacramento, you never heard of the Vostok ice core samples. Uh, well, look up the Vostok ice core sample, Mr. Brown. I'm sure you can Google it. This research is very important. It's very real. It's not created by the Russians. It's not created by the Chinese. It's not created by the Pope. It's not created by Michael Savage. It was obtained by drilling down into the ice above Lake Vostok in Antarctica to a depth of 10,000 feet. French and Russian scientists, uh-oh, obtained deep core samples allowing them to look at, among other things, the history of temperature and carbon dioxide over the past 420,000 years, Jerry. That was long before you seized power using illegal aliens as voters. Guess what they found, Mr. Brown? The Vostok ice core samples showed that increases in carbon dioxide always accompanied increases in temperature, but the increases in temperature always came first. I know that's very hard for you to follow, using only hackneyed phrases about fake science and such, but it's a fact. The increases in carbon dioxide, Governor Brown, consistently lag behind temperature increases by about 800 years. This proves that increased levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere did not cause warming. How could it have? If it didn't happen until after the warming, Governor Brown, this knocks over the whole house of cards. But that's not all the Vostok ice core samples tell us. 325,000 years ago, we learned global temperatures and CO2 levels were higher than they are today. Let me repeat that for all of you out there who've been brainwashed. I know many of you are just entertainers or simply reporters, but you don't have any analytical ability. This has been proven. In the Vostok ice core samples pulled up from 10,000 feet below the Antarctic. It sounds like a science fiction movie, doesn't it? Well, it isn't. That means they drilled down 10,000 feet into the ground, into the ice. They pulled up an ice sample. And then they can analyze what's in the ice, which shows what was in the atmosphere at that time. And guess what they found? 325,000 years ago, global temps and CO2 levels were higher than they are today. I guess Barry Obama didn't get any of this when he was at Columbia University learning how to become a community agitator. In fact, right now, Mr. Brown, we are near the end of another warm interglacial. And those of us who are educated in science know we're actually heading into another glacial cooling period where global temperatures will drop and ice will again form heavily at the poles. It's already happening. The Antarctic recently had the greatest growth of ice in a very long period of time. Don't take my word for it, Governor Brown. Research it for yourself. That's probably the simplest and best answer to the global warmest uh, mafia that's out there looking to rip us off for billions, if not trillions of dollars over the rest of our lives. And I gave it to you for free. Right on the Savage Nation. David on WABC on the issue of why Trump won't come on national talk radio. We're trying to speak directly to the president. We know he's holed up in New Jersey and being a very intelligent man, he's probably bored. I mean, how much golf can you take? How much cable television can you listen to? So I would think once in a while he's clicking on the radio over there and he's picking up WABC 770 on the dial and he's learning stuff about the world right now that he probably is probably very interested in. 
Speaking about global warming, it was very interesting. When I had the pleasure and the honor of meeting President Trump a few months back at Mar-a-Lago, uh, being a New Yorker, I couldn't resist a parting, a parting comment. As he was leaving with the Secret Service, once again, I violated protocol. And I went up to him and I said, wait, President Trump, one last thing. I did a Joan Rivers on him. And he stopped because he and I got along great. I said, let me tell you a short, a short thing about global warming. I saw his eyes glazing over. The minute I said global warming, I saw his mind went, <laughs> went somewhere else. I said, let me, show, let me give you a simple answer to all of these liars out there, the people who never went past the fifth grade in their knowledge of science. I said, Mr. Trump, just say to them, how is it that we had at least seven ice ages that came and went before industrialization? He said, I got it. That's great. I want you to think about that. That's something even Al Gore can understand. In his worst moment, in, in her worst moment after too many Chardonnays, after too many Chardonnays and sleeping pills, even Hillary Clinton would have that one, would have to laugh at that one. In the fifth grade, didn't you learn that there were ice ages that came and went on the planet before, uh, before mankind even arrived on the planet, before he industrialized? So in other words, you want real science? I'll give you a real science because I'm a real scientist by training. I'm not a journalist by training. I'm not a talk show host by training. I'm not a propagandist by training. I'm not a publicist by training. I'm not a pollster by training. I'm not a website operator by training. I have two master's degrees and a PhD by training, and I worked real hard for them. And what it's left me with is the ability to read data, if nothing else. So why don't you read the damn data and stop spouting propaganda? You know what I'm saying? I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. Welcome back to the Savage Nation. I will talk about the fact that Donald Trump just raised the stakes on the Korea thing. And he said that North Korea will be met with fire and fury. It's a very important story. But before I get to that story, which is huge, I knew this was coming, by the way. I have to tell you about something important on a really daily basis. It's your car. Sooner or later, if you have an older car, it's going to break down. It's a fact every car, truck, and SUV owner already knows. Now, if you're lucky, it happens while still under the manufacturer's warranty and the repair is covered. But if it happens after the warranty expires, you could be out of pocket thousands to get it fixed. That's why I do recommend getting extended coverage from carshield.com. A new engine, a new tranny could cost you over 5000 bucks. Even a simple repair to a sensor can cost over $1,000 today. Skip that hassle. Carshield makes the whole process easy. You select your favorite mechanic. You could even go to the dealership to do the work. And there's no check in the mail or waiting for a reimbursement. CarShield gets the mechanic paid directly. CarShield's administrators even give you the VIP treatment. They give you 24-7 roadside assistance, a rental, while yours is in the shop. So you're not left stranded in the cold. Now listen to me. If your car is 3 to 12 years old, it doesn't mean you have to pay high repair bills. CarShield administrators have paid out close to $2 billion in claims and they're real, and they're ready to help you save yourself thousands of potential car repairs. Get covered by the ultimate and extended vehicle service protection before it's too late. Call 800-CAR-6100, code SAVAGE. Or visit carshield.com, use code SAVAGE to save 10%. You got it? Carshield.com, code SAVAGE. A deductible may apply. Minutes ago, Donald Trump warned North Korea that their threats will be met with fire and fury. Play the tape, Robert. This is very important. They will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. He has been very threatening uh, beyond a normal statement. And as I said, they will be met with fire, fury, and frankly, power, the likes of which this world has never seen before. Thank you. That's all. Really simple, straightforward. Cut it out, fat stuff. Hey, fat boy, cut it out. You're shooting your mouth off day and night, threatening the United States? I think even the liberals, the uh, even the Katzenbergs, Hatzenbergs, Matzenbergs, and Rattenbergs, 
might be a little frightened by now. You know, one nuke can ruin your day, Jerry Brown. It's worse than global warming. Even Nancy Pelosi, Diane Feinstein up there in Pacific Heights, even they know that one nuke can ruin their day. Even they're probably glad that they have a president talking tough to that fat slob in North Korea, that maniac, that bum, that loser, that mook, that crazy man. He vows fire and fury against fatso. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7287-SAVAGE. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, the Savage Nation, home of borders, language, culture, and here he is, winner of the National Radio Hall of Fame Award, Michael Savage. A few minutes ago, President Donald Trump came out swinging, and he warned North Korea that threats, quote, will be met with fire and fury. We heard this morning that North Korea successfully created a miniaturized nuclear weapon that can fit in its missile. That's according to the left-wing Washington Post and the left-wing NBC News. Remember, even they don't want to die. Even the punks at NBC News understand that one nuke can ruin your day. Even the Amazon Post understands that it's real bad for business. Real bad for Amazon if a nuke were to be launched onto the U.S. mainland. And so Trump has just warned them. And you got to hear this. This was a few minutes ago from New Jersey, where he's allegedly on vacation. He said, don't make any more threats to the United States. They will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen, has never seen. He has been very threatening. And as I said, they will be met with fire and fury and frankly power, the likes of which this world has never seen before. That's a hell of a statement. Trump made the remarks while getting briefed on the U.S. opioid epidemic during what he calls a working vacation at his New Jersey golf club. Let's listen in on Donald Trump minutes ago at Bedminster, New Jersey. They will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. He has been very threatening uh, beyond a normal statement. And as I said, they will be met with fire, fury, and frankly, power, the likes of which this world has never seen before. Thank you. Now, what could that mean? Power, the likes of which the world has never seen before. What in the world could this weapon be? What do you think he might be using on North Korea? I, 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 there's no jokes here. The U.N. Security Council, the useless U.N. Security Council on Saturday last week, unanimously put new sanctions on North Korea over its continued missile tests. N North Korea has tested two ICBMs that landed off the coast of Japan this year. Even the stone comedians on television recognize how serious this is, but they'll keep bashing Trump anyway. I'm waiting for the day I wake up that they're on the side of North Korea. That's coming very soon. They'll take North Korea's side very soon. So what could this weapon be? And what do you think North Korea will do? Because after the UN imposed the newest sanctions, Fatso said it would bring thousands fold revenge against the US. I mean, you can laugh at him all you want, we know he starves his people to death. That's a given fact. Everyone knows that except Madeleine Albright. We know that he lives like a king while everyone works like a slave. Look at the difference between communist North Korea and capitalist South Korea. All you fools, you idiots, you Bernie Sanders acolytes. You, f oh, I wish I could curse on this show. I'd really like to shake your, you by the ears. How stupid can you be? pushing socialism. Look at the difference between socialist North Korea, where they're eating wood like termites, and South Korea, which produces Samsung televisions, Kia cars, and the people live very well. Look at the difference between socialism in the North and capitalism in the South. How stupid can you idiots be? How much can you take of this lie? 
Why don't you just go to North Korea and find out for yourself? Or go to Cuba and harvest the sugar with your compasseros over there, you morons. Okay, what more can I say to you? People are stupid. And Trump has now just threatened the threat with a bigger threat. What do you think is the weapon he's talking about? What's bigger than an H-bomb? Claude on KSFO, what do you think about Trump's threat to use a weapon the world has never seen before? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Savage, for having me on. That really caught my attention, too. It, it does sound like a cryptic message that uh, implies that we do have weaponry in our arsenals that the world is not aware of, which is, is highly probable and potentially maybe even more destructive uh, than nuclear weapons or perhaps... What, what could that be, though, Claude? You sound like an educated man. What might that be? Oh, you're very kind. Well, you, I read a lot and uh, uh, on this subject, too. And, you know, there is uh, talk about uh, kinetic weapons from outer space that use simply velocity but are massively uh, impactful. We certainly have laser weapons. I've seen, uh, I saw something recently that showed a naval vessel that had a uh, laser device, a small one, that was able to shoot down airplanes. And it actually, they said it cost about a dollar twenty-five per shot. So it's, uh, you know, highly efficient. And they also said that it's quite scalable. Well, here, here's the problem with North Korea, as I and outsiders see it, and maybe some military expert listening to the show across the world on the internet can, can advise me on this. I have read that the North Korean dictator, Fatso Un, has said that if anyone should assassinate him, every, every artillery piece facing south should be fired to the south. They have hundreds of thousands of artillery pieces facing the south. It would kill at least a million South Koreans if they did that. Have you read the same thing? Absolutely, and it's terribly frightening. And also, uh, because of the close proximity to uh, South Korea and to Japan as well, it, it really limits uh, uh, nuclear options to quite a great extent because of the fallout that would be created. Uh, al although uh, there, there well, we don't have. By the way, we don't. We no longer have neutron bombs. You know that George Bush disassembled all of them. Actually, no. The first Bush president took down all of our. All of our weapons like that. I had the developer of the neutron bomb on this show years ago when I was a local host. It's one of the great interviews of my life. One of the greatest of my life. And it was sad for me to learn years later after he died. Samuel Cohen, by the way, was the developer of the neutron bomb. He told me how it was developed. And it was a, a, uh, it, the Vatican at the time even called it a, uh, a saintly weapon of some kind because it doesn't cause physical destruction. The neutron bomb. Do you know that the Bush senior destroyed all of our stockpile of neutron bombs? Are you aware of that? I am aware of that, and it was unthinkable. I think there, there always is, you know, we don't really know what's going on at the current time. And uh, so there, there could be a possibility that we, that we have some. Uh, but I, I would uh, say this, the, the neutron... Okay, my guess is that if Trump launches anything, it's going to be a neutron bomb. I, I would agree with you. I think that that. Okay, I'll put my, I'll put my, I'll put my, my guest's reputation on the line right now. If God forbid this comes down, and Trump launches something bigger than the world has ever seen, the world's never seen a neutron bomb used in combat in any way that I've seen. That's and true. although Bush Senior took them apart, it could be that they were put back together at some point by the patriots in the industrial community. I don't know if that's true or not. They're not, I, if I'm not mistaken, they're not terribly hard to put together. It's really just a hydrogen bomb that is constructed a little bit differently. And it still has some destructive force because it, it has a small fission weapon that initiates it, but a very small one. So it would be a nominal uh, nuclear blast. But with a Claude, are you, an, are you a physicist by any chance? Theoretical physicist. <laughs> I heard it in your voice. I so miss the sound of education <laughs> oh you're uh, i was expelled from high school <laughs> self-educated <laughs> wait when you say you're self-educated did you work as a professional in the, the field of physics no no I, i'm simply a weekend theoretical physicist i read a lot i uh, knowledge is something well why were you expelled from high school your mind was too fast it could be. I actually started working young. I was a uh, songwriter, and I was trying to sell my music to the radio station. So 
rather than going to class, I'd put on a sport jacket, go to the record companies, to the radio stations, and uh, and pitch my own stuff. I've always been an artistic person, and I think that's been my passion. I have an internet business now that I've been focused on for 20 years, and uh, and yes, I think that uh, perhaps uh, uh, perhaps I had what they would refer to as ADD today, but I was my mind was always running. I think highly creative people all have some kind of disorder, don't you? They all want us to be normal paths, flatliners, like those who work in cubicles at Google and think we're saving the world. No thanks. I always was. I always was a type like you. Oh. Uh, never really, I never really fit in anywhere. Claude, thank you for calling. A neutron bomb is, of course, an enhanced radiation weapon. It's a low-yield thermonuclear weapon, and it maximizes lethal neutron radiation in the immediate vicinity of the blast while minimizing the physical power of the blast itself. In other words, it destroys living things but not buildings. Do you hear what I'm saying? Living things die. I know that's very bad, but it's better them than us. A neutron bomb will kill living things, and it will not destroy buildings, bridges, roads. And it was developed by the U.S. in the late 50s and early 60s. It was seen as a cleaner bomb for use against massed Soviet armored divisions, if we ever needed to. And in other words, if the Soviets would have invaded Germany, the weapon was developed by the geniuses at the time to reduce blast damage so it wouldn't damage Germany itself. And we had them. These, uh, these neutron bombs were first operationally deployed for ABMs, and uh, they were ready to go. We never used them. And what happened was the anti-nuke lunatics... Uh, had George Bush the first take them apart, the last I checked, we never, ever had any left. As I said, the neutron bomb was credited to Samuel T. Cohen of the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, who developed the concept in 1958. You know, old white male and all that. He never took diversity training. Samuel T. Cohen never took diversity training. And he developed a neutron bomb. Can you imagine what the leftists would have said to him today if he was in at UC Berkeley today, Samuel T. Cohen? They would have driven him off with a, with a pitchfork. You know, I think we should get that interview with Samuel Cohen, Robert. No one else in radio has it. Uh, maybe I'll play it today. Maybe I'll play it tomorrow. It's one of the greatest interviews I've ever done. Oh, I have a lot to say about this subject, about neutron bombs. Now, I'm not saying that Trump's implying he's going to use that, but he did imply that he said the world, we're going to use a weapon greater than the world has ever seen. What do you think he's talking about? What could it be? The U.S. has never deployed a neutron weapon. Never. Okay. So what other countries have neutron bombs? It's known that France France and China tested neutron or enhanced radiation bombs. France conducted an early test of neutron bomb technology in 1967 and tested an actual neutron bomb in 1980. They tested the technology in 67, an actual neutron bomb in 1980. China conducted a successful test of neutron bomb principles in 1984 and a successful test of a neutron bomb in 1988. However, neither of these countries deployed the neutron bomb. China said at the time that China had no need for the neutron bomb, but it was developed to serve as a technology reserve in case the need arose in the future. In 1999, the Indian government disclosed that India was capable of producing a neutron bomb. Hmm. Now, what kind of yield do they have? That's an interesting question. We can talk about that. I don't think it's important. But the question is, would Trump actually launch a neutron bomb against North Korea? They have explosive yields lower than other nuclear weapons. Neutrons are scattered and absorbed by air. Neutron radiation effects drop off rapidly, rapidly. So in terms of thermal effects between areas of high lethality and areas with minimal radiation doses, it's a world of difference between a neutron bomb and a regular bomb, okay? I don't think he's going to drop a 50 megaton SAR bomber, do you? I don't think he could drop a, a, a hydrogen bomb on North Korea without massively 
damaging China, South Korea, Japan forever. Okay, this is a big, big story because Donald Trump just threatened the biggest threat on the planet, which is North Korea, Kim Jong mentally ill on. I'll be right back to talk more about what I think it may be. If he uses it, it's probably going to be a neutron bomb right here on the Savage Nation. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. So Donald Trump, just from his New Jersey uh, hideaway or state or golf club, threatened the biggest threat to the planet, Kim Jong-un, who's been threatening the United States regularly right now, that whether he's going to kill us. And that includes, of course, the geniuses of Hollywood. I mean, even if they have bulletproof Rolls Royces, you see, one neutron bomb, uh, one uh, nuclear bomb can, can destroy their very day. That applies to all of the fools on the left, the right. You see, nukes do not discriminate. They don't just kill conservatives. They can kill all of us. We have a president who's also the commander in chief, and he just said he laid down the he laid down the gauntlet. He told Fatso over there, "Shut your big pie ma- pie hole. Just shut the hell up. Stop threatening us, or we'll do something to you the world has never seen." Now we're speculating on the Savage Nation what this means. What is he talking about? What kind of weapon has never been used? I believe it could be a neutron bomb. Even though Bush Senior disassembled or had all of our neutron bombs disassembled. We led the world in nuclear technology. But Bush Sr., CIA chief, then president, you talk about deep state, wow, took it apart. Now maybe they redeveloped some of them. According to his memoir, the father of the neutron bomb who was on this show when I was a local host wrote this. And listen, this is very ironic. According to his memoir, Shame, Confessions of the Father of the Neutron Bomb, Samuel Cohen hit upon this idea to develop the bomb during a 1901 visit, 1951 visit to Seoul, Korea. When he witnessed the devastation of the Korean War, he said in his journals, the question I asked to myself was something like, if we're going to go on fighting these damn fool wars in the future, shelling and bombing cities to smithereens and wrecking the lives of their surviving inhabitants, might there be some kind of nuclear weapon that could avoid all this? That's Samuel Cohen. So he developed a smaller version of a hydrogen bomb. And without going into the details, because I'm not a physicist, you can read it for yourself. You'll find out what the difference is between a neutron bomb and a hydrogen bomb. Basically, a neutron bomb is a hydrogen bomb without the uranium-238. And this lowers the explosive yield while letting the neutrons bust out all over. So if he dropped a blast in the sky over North Korea the next time Fatso opened his yap... Okay? Believe me, the enemy combatants are dead. Fatso is reduced to a ball of jelly. Threat over. North Koreans are liberated. Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. Savage. President Trump just warned of fire and fury after a report revealed that North Korea has made missile-ready nuclear weapons. Now, of course, the left will attack Trump, not Kim Jong-un. The late-night stoner comedians who do not know rationality from irrationality, it's lucky they could put their pants on in the morning, will no doubt make jokes about President Trump calling him Hitler. But you and I both know that as commander-in-chief, he has one job, that supersedes all other jobs, and that's to keep the American people safe. It's long overdue to tell Fatso in North Korea to shut his, his mouth or he's going to fry him, and that's what he just said. But he said it in an odd way. He said something quite eerie, President Trump did, and I want you to hear it for the third time on the Savage Nation, and then I'm going to ask you what weapon do you think. Wait, don't play it yet. He's, he's stating we might use. I think it's a neutron bomb of some kind. And we even have the interview with the inventor of the neutron bomb. No one in the media has this. Nobody, no matter how big or no matter how small, ever interviewed 
Samuel Cohen, I did when I was a, a local talk show host on KSFO. It was one of the crowning moments of my life because he's one of the greatest geniuses of our time. Now, what do you think is actually going on here? What really is going on here is a couple of things. And it's not all pretty for you to hear. First of all, this war talk is very alarming for all of us. There's nothing to be celebrated here. People are going to die, and some of them may be our own troops. That's number one. But at a certain point, you have to fight, or you'll be smashed. It's that simple. He is threatening us with nuclear weapons. That means you liberals, you progressives, whatever you may be, you got to understand you'll be smashed in a nuclear uh, exchange if you, let, if you let this maniac in North Korea go any further. Just as Hitler should have been stopped at Munich. Hitler could have been stopped at Munich, but people didn't have the guts to stop him. This maniac in North Korea needs to be stopped now, and we finally have a president who probably will stop him. He threatened fire and fury. The president, our president, did. Now, this reminds me very much of the prelude to war with Japan. And uh, as we well know, there's a controversy surrounding the attack on Pearl Harbor. We've read all of the reports. We read that the U.S. government under Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, knew that Japan was going to attack Pearl Harbor, but let it happen because America did not want war, just as we don't want war now. Uh, most people don't want war. Same people don't want war. We lost so many men in World War I, no one wanted war with anybody. We were a nation at peace in the 1930s. We wanted peace at all costs. And nobody had the stomach for war. So FDR, at least one uh, of the plots goes, and I've read books on the subject, permitted Pearl Harbor to, to occur so we could call a sneak attack, and he declared war on Japan, and that was the beginning of that. We cannot afford to let Kim Jong mentally ill on uh, nuke Alaska, nuke Hawaii, nuke Japan. God knows what this maniac might do uh, now that he feels he can do it with the ICBMs off a sub. We don't know how far he's gone. He could have a submarine right now ready to launch right off the coast of, of California. Do you know that? And it could cause more damage than global warming, Al Gore, or you fools. So the president, as commander-in-chief and protector of the American people, said something very explosive today. It just happened. This is the biggest news of our life, by the way. The biggest news of our life. Think about this. Trump said North Korea best not make any more threats of the United States. They will be met with the fire and fury and, frankly, power, the likes of which this world has never seen before. Knowing something about Trump's thinking and speaking he was leaking something there. The likes of which this world has never seen before indicates it's going to be an unconventional response to the mad one over in North Korea. So we're speculating what it might be. We know that North Korea has a long history of making threats about its military powers. However, since Trump took office, he has, in North Korea, made good on those threats. And he's exceeded experts' expectations of how fast its arsenal could develop. He's probably much further along than we might imagine. The Stalinist country ran two tests in July for ICBMs. Did you hear what I just said? Intercontinental ballistic missiles. That means it could even affect Hollywood. Yeah, I know you don't believe it. They, they're immune to everything. You know that an ICBM could even reach Silicon Valley? Yeah. Even Tim Crook. Even the Google headquarters might be damaged in some way. The glass might break. This is not a, a joking matter at all. Because North Korea just yesterday vowed to launch a thousandfold revenge against the United States for the sanctions. And he said, listen to me, all you moron liberals, quote, America would pay a price for its crime against our country and people. Now, I know, I know, it's Trump causing it all. I realize it's not North Korea, it's Trump. So I suggest you pack your bags and take a one-way flight to Pyongyang and uh, spend the rest of your life over there and eat straw while you're at it because it's a vegan diet. You'd eat a nice vegan diet in North Korea since there's nothing else to eat but straw. You'll eat like a, like a donkey. So what is it going to be? I don't know. But we do have a short version of uh, the Samuel Cohen interview and a long version. 
I want to play the short version in this segment if we can. But hold on a minute. All of this talk reminds me of what Truman said to the Japanese before Hiroshima. Remember, Truman actually told the Japanese to surrender after their navy had been destroyed, after their ground forces had been destroyed, they were fighting on. And Truman tried to warn them that if they didn't submit to an unconditional surrender, something terrible would happen to Japan. Well, the militarists in Japan didn't believe Truman. And shortly thereafter, uh, as a matter of fact, Fat Boy was dropped on Hiroshima. That was the name of the bomb. I think it was Fat Boy, the first one. And then tragically, uh, or not so tragically, if it was your grandfather or father who would have died in a battle to take Japan, he dropped another one on Nagasaki. That was the end of Japan's militarism. So now they are a certain number of 70 years later or so, and they're terrified of their maniac neighbor from North Korea who's threatening Japan. So believe me, believe me, something's going to happen. This sounds like a prelude to Hiroshima to me. Eddie on W off your radio, Eddie. Okay, goodbye, Charlie. See, this is what I love, prepared callers. WABC, Heshi, line eight, get ready, here we go. Heshi, you're on the Savage Nation. Go um, ahead, please. Michael, uh, I think uh, Trump is going to use some sort of nuclear weapon, but I'm scared, I'm worried how uh, McMaster and his deep state uh, generals are going to play around with this war, because this war could be uh, World War II on steroids. No, wait a minute. Uh, hold it, now you're jumping. Why McMaster must be thrown into this discussion? I know he's the new boogeyman of the conservative movement. Uh, the, the president just said he's going to use a weapon the world has never seen before. Exactly, but we can have Russia and China who are uh, in Europe. This is going to be another World War III. Wait, 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 hold on, slow down. You're frightened, of course you're frightened. You're not alone. A rational person would be frightened when you have a maniac like Kim Jong-un threatening to nuke America. Of course you should be frightened. I, I, have fe I have feared this all of my adult life. In fact, all of my life, I have feared the end of the world because of a nuclear war. It's driven me since I'm a little boy. This is not a joking matter. If, you're, if you are a rational person, you would be frightened. This is not a laughing matter. This is not something for Rachel Maddow to, to give the sneaker on the television set to her girlfriends, you know, with the sneer. This is not a sneering matter. This is serious business. What would you suggest that Donald Trump do to stop that madman from launching against Hawaii or, or Alaska or Japan? What should he do? Uh, I think he has no choice, but it, it, I think they're going to make it a bigger, uh, the, uh, the generals are going to make it as far as they can, like stretch it as far as they can, more. Uh, okay, so your fear is that if Trump launches a war against North Korea, they're going to want to escalate it to a war against China? 100 percent because this is their well macarthur wanted to do that in north korea by taking the war up to the chinese border and then the chinese launched three hundred thousand shock troops over the border killing so many of our men butchering them no i don't think we're going to launch a war against china personally moreover i don't think china would be upset if we launched a nuclear eh, pardon me a neutron bomb against north korea they might be thankful if he was gone yeah but but, but you know the deep state they don't care as long as they get the money. Well, we, it's a common, it's too much, it's used too much already, deep state, deep state. That's like saying French fries. Now, what, what, is deep, fries? what does deep state mean? A few men in, in wait, a few men in the, in the intelligence communities? That's what the deep state means? They're not running the country. Trump is running the country. Thank All right, thanks for the, we disagree on that. All right, get out your fallout shelters. How many minutes is the short Samuel Cohen thing, Robert? A shorty? Okay, I got something for you on the Savage Nation that no one in the media ever had. And I welcome uh, anyone in television to pick this up and run it. Uh, just, uh, just credit the Savage Nation radio show. It's very important the world hear this. This is Samuel Cohen, the man who developed or invented the neutron bomb while up at Lawrence Livermore, Livermore Laboratories. Uh, he came on this show. This is while well, I was a local talk show host in the 90s. Listen to this carefully. Right now, without any further introduction, we have Samuel Cohen. Dr. Cohen, thank you very much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. Dr. Cohen, you, you actually developed the neutron bomb, is that correct? I developed the concept. I didn't 
you know, screw the thing together. I could barely screw in a light bulb. <laughs> well, I can, I can appreciate that. So you are a theoretical physicist, is that? I was trained that way, yes. Okay. What is a neutron bomb? Well, with all due respect to Edward Teller, who's a, an old acquaintance of mine, going on back to World War II at Los Alamos, uh, who doesn't seem to, to know about it or even have heard about it, uh, a neutron bomb is the antithesis of the hydrogen bomb that Teller has been called the father of. And instead of laying waste, uh, you know, to practically hold countries and theoretically even exterminating the world with long-lasting radioactivity and, and so on and so forth, what the neutron bomb is intended to do is to be able to be used in a ground war. And these things go on apace, and they always have throughout human history. But to use this weapon in a fashion that lives up to the so-called Christian just war principles, which are based on the premise that if wars are to be fought, unfortunately, that the most moral thing to do is to separate the enemy, the aggressor, from the civilian populace, the alleged innocents, so that when uh, you know, all these weapons have been used, uh, the enemy will have been decimated uh, by the neutrons uh, coming out of the bomb and the, so that, that all their tank units uh, would be put out of action. But on the other hand, with respect to the civilians who in conventional warfare have always been involved with the war itself and had their cities bombed, and shelled into oblivion. And now let me just pause and say we're repeating that right now over in the Balkans, and it bothers me. Yeah, well, ki it kills me to much it, it kills me. me to see what we're doing to the civilian population. I'll tell you that it's it's heartbreaking. Join the Savage Nation. Call now eight five five four hundred Savage eight five five four hundred seven two eight two Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call eight hundred two eight nine twenty six forty six or SwissAmerica dot com. We're going to return to the biggest story of our lives, by the way. This is real. You know, one nuclear bomb can destroy your peace of mind. It's bigger than climate change, which is a fraud. And maybe this will wake the uh, socialist, liberal uh, gangsters up. But everybody needs a good night's sleep, and I'm going to tell you about that right now because this is an important story. You ever wake up in the middle of the night sweating and you can't sleep? What are you going to do, run your fan, your AC because you're overheated? Why don't you just get rid of your rotten mattress and sleep as cool as the other side of the pillow like I do on my great Casper mattress? It's made of two high-tech foams which guarantee you sleep cool, comfortable, and fully supported every night. It comes to you in a box so small you won't believe it actually holds a mattress, really. Casper does this, does this so you can try it for risk-free for 100 nights in your own house. If you don't love it, they'll come pick it up and give you back every dime. From its breakthrough design and superior quality to its packaging and 100 night at home trial, it is no wonder Casper was named one of Fast Company's 50 most innovative brands of 2017. Try your Casper for 100 nights with free shipping and returns. All you got to do is go to Casper.com, use code SAVAGE for $50 towards the purchase of your mattress. It's simple. Casper.com, code SAVAGE. Get $50 towards the purchase of your mattress. Casper.com, terms and conditions apply. <clears throat> There's no bigger story than this. Trump has just warned North Korea. He told Fatso to shut his yap or he's going to use a weapon the world has never seen. So I've been speculating it could be a neutron bomb that was reconstructed secretly because Bush took a part on neut neutron bombs. And I played for you an interview with Samuel Cohen, the inventor of the neutron bomb. It was the, I think it was the high point of my radio career at the time. I don't know anything bigger than that in the media. This man, Samuel Cohen, developed the neutron bomb. And you heard it on the Savage Nation. So you say, well, big deal. Yeah, it's a big deal. How often do you ever hear great men like this in this world of mediocrity and lower, in this world of stupid Kardashian mentality? 
How often do you hear genius like this? How often can you hear it when you're saturated with filth day and night from the vermin who run the media? Every day, every night, violence and filth and sexual degeneracy, day and night. And they lecture us about microaggressions. Well, I'm not worried about microaggressions. I'm worried about a nuclear bomb in San Francisco or a nuclear bomb in Honolulu or a nuclear bomb in, in Tokyo. That's what I'm worried about. What if, uh, what if they have submarines right now, which they do have, North Korea? Don't underestimate this one. I've read the reports. They've been seen with 70-foot towers on them. You think they couldn't launch overnight, catch us off guard? Believe me, it could happen. Or worse yet, we could have Trojan horses in this nation with all of the open borders from the years of open borders. There could be North Korean agents with suitcase bombs in this country. Right? You didn't think about that. The next time you go to a Korean restaurant, look around your country, you idiots, you. It's been wide open like a can opener opened it up under Obama. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of borders, language, culture. And here he is, winner of the National Radio Hall of Fame Award, Michael Savage. They will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. He has been very threatening uh, beyond a normal statement. And as I said, they will be met with fire, fury, and frankly, power, the likes of which this world has never seen before. Thank you. Wow. This is the biggest news story of our life. Uh, <laughs> there's nowhere to go from here. Trump, just an hour ago, demanded North Korea not make any more threats to the United States. That would include Katzenberg, Katzenberg, Matzenberg, and Ratzenberg. That would include the vermin at CNN. Because one nuclear bomb can destroy your day, even if you're a progressive. You know that? Do you know that even if you're a progressive, you might be hurt by a nuclear bomb launched by North Korea? And he said, Trump did, that uh, the U.S. would respond with fire and fury like the world has never seen. Now, I don't know whether he means if they should launch or preemptively we would launch. But as I said in the last hour, we don't know what this madman in, in, in Korea might do. We know that he's a madman. We know he's a Stalin-Hitler co combination, a combo deal. We know he kills his own people. We know that he stars his own people. We know it's a slave labor state. It's perhaps one of the last of the great slave labor states under communism on the earth, a holdover from the 1930s, 40s, early 50s. China, of course, is a mixture between communism and capitalism. China is, of course, a police state, but the people are financially well off. Uh, they can buy things. They can build things. The country is booming. The communist Chinese leaders were very clever indeed. They took the best of the United States from their point of view, which was the materialism, and left behind liberty. That, that they didn't learn in their, in their, in their uh, communist indoctrination. But let, let's put the philosophy aside. Trump is vowing fire and fury. I played for you in the last hour a, an interview I did in 1999 or 1998 with the inventor of the neutron bomb, Samuel Cohen. I remembered listening to that short interview and <clears throat> why I had him on. I was vehemently opposed to what Bill Clinton was doing to the Serbians in the Balkan War. I was sickened by it. I couldn't sleep for over 60 days as Clinton mercilessly bombed every bridge on the Danube River. Clinton killed people in hospitals. He killed people in schools. He killed people on railway cars. And none of the vermin in the media reported once about any Serbian deaths. You talk about fake news. You think this just started under Trump? You're mistaken. Did you ever see a picture of a bridge blown up on the Danube River, blown up by United States Air Force jets, bombers, that is? 
repainted with NATO markings by by the Mad Hatter, uh, Madeleine Albright, and that psychopath that worked for Jamie, whatever, Rubin. Was it Jamie Rubin? Jamie Rubin, married to one of the news reporters from CNN, by the way. Foaming at the mouth, old Jamie, with white foam spittle coming out of the side of his mouth, foaming with joy as Clinton was bombing the Serbians. I got sick watching it because I knew the Serbs had been our allies in World War II. I knew the Serbs were allies against radical Islam. I knew they were a Christian nation. And I watched Clinton mercilessly destroy the Serbian infrastructure. So I got Samuel Cohen on the show. And you heard what he said. I don't know if you missed it. But it's a very important interview. Now, it's funny how talk radio is. I began by talking about, you go to my Twitter thing. I You know, I ran into a guy, black guy, who was cleaning cars who I've known for years off and on, Dave. And he uh, runs Big God Ministries. And we played that soundbite. I thought we would talk about spiritual matters for a moment. And then we went on to why do you think Trump won't come on talk radio? We went on that for a moment. And all of a sudden, toward the end of the last hour, bingo, there was the president saying that's it. Bingo, bingo, bingo. No more. He drew a line in the sand. So there's no going back from what Trump just said. This is his biggest test to date. Now, I I try to tell you why this is happening right now. I suspected this would happen. I told friends that there's going to be a war with Korea in August, probably while he's on vacation. I've said that to people in the media. You don't have to believe me or not. It doesn't matter. They know who they are. They're listening to this show. They're some of the biggest people on, on this side of the dial or on this side of the aisle. And I said his ratings are down, and usually a couple of... It's crazy, I know, it was due to do with his popularity. There is a connection. His popularity is in the toilet, even amongst his base. And I'll talk about that for a minute. Why doesn't he have popularity with his base, even though the economy is booming? Because they're not getting any benefits from it. The economy is booming for the people who hate him. This is the greatest paradox of our political life. The economy is booming for all of the left-wingers in Hollywood, who have huge properties and lots of stock options. They've never had it so good. They've never been richer. The very men who hate him, the very women who hate him have never been as rich because of him. While the Eddie out there who put him in office has not really benefited. I haven't seen any new factories. There's, yeah, job reports are good. Employment is down. But the unemployment is down. But the thing is, the average guy isn't feeling it out there. So that's why his popularity is dwindling, amongst other things. And he's, he has been his worst enemy as well. You can blame the deep state. You can blame the media all you want. I've said a thousand times if he'd stop tweeting and become more presidential and give far fewer speeches and make them only before the uh, White House, the Oval Office lectern, his popularity would be much higher. Be more presidential. Stop being so petty. Stop attacking the fools in the media. Don't make it so personal. You're the most powerful man on earth. You don't have to use Twitter. That's for an eight-year-old girl who's getting even with a schoolgirl. I know I'm on Twitter. I get it. Maybe I'm getting even with a schoolgirl. I don't know. But I'm on Twitter now because he is. I figured if you can't beat him, join him. But I don't use it for personal vendettas. I don't use it to attack people. I'm using it for fun. But now let's get back to business at hand. His ratings are down. His popularity is in the toilet. We are really being threatened by by North Korea, the North Korea madman. They're not making that up. So the perfect storm has arrived for uh, a war. Yes, you heard me. The perfect storm, all the the elements are in place for a war. This is how they work. When a leader is in trouble politically and when there are, uh, let us say, machinations towards war by another, by the, by an enemy, a clear, clear machinations towards war, that's when wars occur. They don't really occur on their own. We do now have almost a perfect storm. There's only one element missing right now for a launch. And I I don't even want to tell you what that is. I think you can pretty much figure it out for yourself. My guesstimate is that it's going to happen, and it's going to happen sooner than you think, and it's going to happen with the blink of an eye overnight. And Trump, on one hand, the people will love him, maybe. However, the vermin in the media will make him the bad guy. No matter what he does, the vermin in the media, the psychopaths, the drug addicts, the sickos will blame him for it. So he has to wait. My advice to President Trump would be don't preemptively launch against Fatso. You must wait for Fatso to do something and then crush him. Crush him hard. But don't do it first. That's the sad truth. Because of the vermin in the media, because of the the heroin addicts, 
the marijuana addicts, the alcoholics, the lushes, the junkies who put on clean shirts in the morning in the media. Because of those junkies in the media, he cannot act first. He has to wait for some people to die who uh, could be us. That's what's going to have to happen. Now, let's say he does use a neutron bomb against North Korea. Let's say North Korea does something crazy like launch against, oh, I don't know, a slightly inhabited Japanese piece, a piece of Japanese territory, or he launches against the Aleutian Islands just to show he can. Would that be enough for Trump to blast Fatso into eternity? Would that be enough for Trump to turn Fatso into jelly and still be uh, get credit for it? I don't know. With the vermin in the media, with the level of drug use rampant in the media, with the disconnection from reality, I don't, really don't know what might happen at that point. I do know that it has to be done, and it will be done. But what do you think the weapon might be? Moreover, tomorrow I want to play for you the full interview with Samuel Cohen, the, uh, the inventor of the neutron bomb. I gave you a two-minute three-minute snippet of it. It's amazing to listen to it. I'm bubbling over with desire to tell you more about this than I can at the moment because my heart is actually pounding in my, in my throat. Ever since I've been a little boy, remember to the age of five, I feared a nuclear war. And I remember when it happened. It's what's driven me most of my life. I don't know if you know this. I may have said this once in 20 some odd years. I was a little kid in the streets of the Bronx and I remember picking up a raggedy newspaper blowing in the wind and the headline in the newspaper <coughs> showed, how old was I? God, I don't even know how old I was, a kid. I guess it showed a mushroom cloud and Japan or something like that. I must have been a really little kid. And I re remember picking it up and running through the streets screaming the world is coming to an end. I ran up and down Longfellow Avenue, Longfellow the poet. Little kid, I don't know, I was a couple of years old. How could I be? I was with three, four years old. I saw the, nu the, 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 the mushroom cloud. I ran with the newspaper that was blowing in the street, screaming, the world is coming to an end. The world is... So they thought I was crazy. All of the poor people in the neighborhood, my mother must have been very embarrassed for me. Little did she know that the Bible had said that your children will prophesy or something that expect. Your old men will dream dreams and your children will prophesy. She didn't know that piece of the Bible. But I saw it and I feared it, and it drove me most of my life. It drove me to the furthest corners of the earth. You don't know this. One of the things that drove me to the Fiji Islands, to Samoa, to Tonga, to Marquesas, looking for healing plants, was I was always looking for a refuge from what I thought was the coming nuclear war. Now, I know this is crazy to most of you. It's not real. You live in a different bubble, different world, a different, a different atrium of reality. I wrote a novel years ago called Survivor. And uh, it's not a completed novel. And I put it up on Kindle. And it's a couple of bucks. And it was about a family that uh, was on a sailboat. They fled on a sailboat just before a nuclear blast because there were machinations of war. And he was a submarine commander. And he knew all about sailing. And he built a special ship. It was a modern-day version of the Swiss Family Robinson. It's a fabulous, fabulous script. Would make a great movie. But because I am blackballed by Katzenberg, Hatzenberg, Matzenberg, and Ratzenberg, all you get is filth and pollution on the silver screen and on the digital screens. But what a movie. That would be Survivor. It's on Kindle, by the way, if you want to read one. I researched, I researched so carefully what kind of uh, sailboat would have to be built to withstand the nuclear blast, and I mean from many, many miles away on the ocean. And I described, I think, in great detail what it would be like to be on a sailboat if the blast hit, I think the blast in that case was aimed at Hawaii and it hit Hawaii and they were out at sea and they flee to get away from the, from the radiation zone. It's a, a husband, a wife, and two or three children and they're heading to the South Seas to start a new life because at the time, this, it's still true to this day that the South Pacific Islands are outside of the nuclear uh, fall zone. Did you know that? The radiation zone? The Southern Hemisphere? I don't know if you know that. That's why the people in Brazil are so happy. Uh, it's because all they have on their mind is, is drug, sex, and rock and roll. They, they don't think about anything because they're outside the nuclear blast zone. So here we are, my friends. It's driven me, and here we are. Is it going to happen? I hope not. I hope I was just a very nervous little kid. I'll be right back.
Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. To the BBC, Japan has begun its first civilian air raid drill since the end of World War II. That's to wake all of you up in, uh, in, the, in the fog city of San Francisco. Japan, peaceful Japan, began its first civilian air raid drills since the end of World War II. Uh, this is in reaction to deal with the madman in North Korea. They're terrified of the madman in North Korea. I realize you in Hollywood and San Francisco think you live in your own world, and that you're immortal, but you're not immortal, and you don't live in your own world. After all, didn't you teach us that the Earth is a small planet? So the Japanese are now conducting civilian air raid drills. One Japanese citizen said this, we're told to hit the ground or hide behind the wall, but will that really help? Will that really protect us if a missile really falls here, I wonder, when interviewed by the BBC. U.S. analysts at the Defense Intelligence Agency reached similar conclusions about North Korea's capabilities in an assessment prepared last month. All of this can be read on Breitbart by John Hayward. U.S. and Japanese analysts agree North Korea has developed nuclear missile warheads. Now, we well know that Obama, while apologizing for the existence of America and attacking the core of this nation's uh, history, its founding fathers, everything good about it, he let this madman grow into the, into the Frankenstein that he is. Here is former Bush NSA director Michael Hayden in clip six. You must hear this right now on the Savage Nation. Frankly, the Obama administration, I think, deserves some fair criticism for their strategic patience, which was, frankly, paying this problem forward, uh, not solving it on their watch and passing it forward to the Trump administration. And the Trump team deserves some credit for getting these sanctions. They are very tough. They kept the Russians on side. They got the Chinese to agree to them as well. So those are the sanctions against North Korea. But the fact is, the next day he raised the stakes. Listen to me. This guy, you got to understand something that you may not understand. He's not you. He's not a rational person. When you have absolute power, as Kim Jong mentally ill un does, a mentally ill un doesn't think. A mentally ill un reacts or acts. And mentally ill un in North Korea didn't react to the sanctions in a rational manner. He raised the stakes, saying we'll wipe the, something to the effect that we'll get even with you a thousandfold, meaning America. So that means even Hollywood could pay the price for, uh, this, uh, for, the, for the pacifism of Obama and for passing the buck uh, on to Trump. So we don't know what tomorrow will bring, let alone the day after tomorrow or the day after the day after tomorrow. I wonder what the weapon is that Trump is implying that we're going to drop on them. KSFO, D-Line 3. 30 seconds or less. Go ahead, please. Here near the birthplace of the atomic bomb, they've been in White Sands, New Mexico. They've been testing lasers for at least the last decade, Dr. Savage. Preparing for the savages of the world like this guy that one of my children has been scared of since he's been a little boy. Even he knew that the instability in North Korea was not good. And it does need to be dealt with. And who cares? Can you imagine if can you imagine if this if this if this cockroach is eliminated, what a liberation that would be for the entire Korean Peninsula to be one unified nation of productive individuals are free to develop their own lives instead of being crushed under the thumb of this bed bug? Absolutely. Just just I mean, think about this. Think about how stupid the college girls are. They, they glorify socialism. North Korea, they eat straw. Run by a dictator, a socialist dictator. South Korea, free state, free nation. Look at the booming cities in South Korea. They produce the Kia car, a great car. They produce Samsung televisions. North Korea produces slave labor camps. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. Somewhere, somewhere waiting for me. 
All right, let's play it a little bit. I gotta catch my breath. Nuclear war, nuclear war now. Oh boy. Okay, here we are. So I've been driven with this fear since I'm a little boy, as I told you. And in the 1980s, I started a novel entitled Survivor, The Survivor. And it was about a, um, a sub-commander who fits out a, a boat in the case there'd be a war to save his family. So I'm going to read you a few pages from this novel, which is available on Kindle. And this chapter of The Survivor is called Fish and Storm at Sea. Okay, bop, bop, bop. Passing through the Straits of Juan de Fuca, Mac Williams thought it would be just another practice run. The sails furled full out as the 60-foot yawl survivor nose south-southwest. Many times the gray-bearded skipper had made the same dry run in the past 18 months. Out 100 miles, south 100 miles, and southwest for some practice shooting with his assortment of automatic weapons, flares, and a few hand grenades over the side. He had it pretty well rehearsed by now. In addition to the muscular skipper, now a shrewd, skilled 48-year-old, there was Galen, his second wife, half his age, and his two sons from the first marriage, John, age 17, tall and blonde like his natural mother, and Mark, 15, sh dark, short, brooding, and unpredictable, a new shoot in the family's genea uh, geniality. It's not geniality, genealogy. Though it was just another weekend practice run, the fourth this year, the yacht was fully provisioned. It was always kept like that. Extra stainless steel tanks gave them 800 gallons of fresh water. But the always cautious father had also had a desalinator installed. It could make fresh water from the sea the rate of three gallons an hour, using the sun's energy or precious little fuel when that failed. He was a confident sailor, having learned late in life but well the way of the sea, sky, stars, tides, and winds. But he insisted on a pair of powerful diesel engines when the yacht was being built, deciding on Twin Perkins. The Ford Lehman was good but often fouled in hard seas being for tractors, not water. The well-proportioned survivor carried 1,000 1, gallons of fuel, enabling her to sail that many miles on power alone. But Mac Williams intended to sail to his South Seas hideaway in the event of the emergency of a nuclear war he feared on land. The engines and fuel were for ne negotiating bays, inlets, and lagoons over the many few less years that would be ahead in a post-nuclear world. And so they sailed. Each had his chores. Each enjoyed them. And none except the skipper ever thought the reality of his fears would change their easy, secure life into one long run through hell. Mark was out on the bowsprit, taking the rushing air first. He loved the sense of life it gave to his otherwise depressed days. Up and down, sidewise and twisting, Survivor carried her brooding child sharply through the spray. Wearing full weather gear with his lifeline always on up there, the boy was lost in a dreamlike reverie when the flash punctured his cocoon. He was the first to see it. Making his way back along the teak and cork deck, Mark dropped excitedly into the cabin below where the others were playing cards, the yawl on full all autopilot now, bearing Dewey's back home. Dad, Dad, he screamed, startling the players. Did you see the flash? It was green and big from where, roared the ferocious-looking man. Where? What direction? Due west, Dad, out there. Instinctively, Mac Williams knew it was the real thing. He quickly barked his orders and prepared for the coming storm that held their fate. Galen, take the wheel. Do west. Galen. <clears throat> west, John, come. Come with me. And Mark, make the cabin ready. Bandit, their 30-pound border collie, was put in the forward cabin in a special padded box by the younger boy, who also fastened things and secured the hatches. The older boy and his father hustled above decks to drop the sails and stow them below. The angular, lithe young woman gripped the wooden wheel of, at the interior steering station and checked on the emergency band of their Halicraft radio. She felt frightened and unsure of herself, but still relished the adventure. It was peculiar to know they all might be wiped out and still feel excited by the challenge of the new reality. She surveyed the sea ahead through the stormproof glass and saw the growing kaleidoscope of color. It was the real thing, and she, the atheist, found herself muttering the prayer <clears throat> she had so hated during her early Catholic school years. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it in heaven. Just then her husband hollered, Galen, Galen, what have you heard? The radio, any news? She had forgotten the radio. Now awakened to her task, she listened anew, raising the volume. No, 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 nothing yet, she answered, as she kept trying sharper frequencies. Well, sound the horn if you do hear anything, okay? And he popped back up on deck to finish securing the sails. Mark was up in the forecastle gathering the sails and folding them. The others, the jib, main, and auxiliary were already furled tightly around the mast. The radio cracked its tail of woe. Repeat, repeat, Honolulu has received direct hit from an enemy nuclear warhead. All ships steer clear. All ships clear the area. 
Of course, it was a futile warning. Any ship within 50 miles of the island would be atomized within 100 miles, fried instantly, within 300 miles, probably blown over by the hurricane strength winds. But what would happen over 2,000 miles away, wondered the woman as she sounded the horn. The man and his older son jumped below, their jobs above now done, and the younger boy too came forward to the main cabin where their mother steered. They looked to her for the news, the radio transmission now out for some reason. Her face was wet with perspiration. Her hands refused to fail her, holding steadily as she continued to steer them away from their due westerly course, now heading east, east, back to the mainland. Her husband started the big engines. The familiar sound transmitted a secure feeling to the ship and her crew who now listened intently as the woman told them what they all feared. As she formed the words, a surreal impression of the scene momentarily overtook her. She felt as though she had smoked very strong cannabis and was hallucinating. They, I mean the radio, it said uh, Honolulu's been hit nuclear, I think. As the collective mind and that substantial but insignificant speck afloat in the Pacific Ocean began to understand what had occurred, the radio suddenly cut in abruptly, ruining their meditation on the facts. Nevada, repeat, the Las Vegas vicinity has been hit by a thermonuclear blast. All planes alter course at once. This is a federal communications authorized by the United States Coast Guard. All ships off the West Coast do not head for port. Repeat, do not. <clears throat> Just then the dog began to howl. Mark ran forward to calm the poor creature whose scream was now unsettling. One, on full alert and in something of a panic, McWilliams went for the wheel to replace Galen. When they both saw the vision feared by men since the first of that hardy species had set out on, on the sea, a huge series of waves of immense ocean liner size came at the little buoyant container from all sides. Above this horrific nightmare was a flash of orange fire. Before they could react, it was on them. Mac Williams grabbed the woman he loved, the woman he had sought through all of the bad years, and pulled her down onto the soft couch like satay. As the water engulfed the craft, he yelled to the boys, Johnny, Mark, down, down, and then it was as if a dream. Hospitals and madhouses are filled with people who have such visions as realized by the Mac Williams family. I'm going to take a break. I'm reading to you from my 1986 or 1988 novel, The Survivor, available on Kindle. The reason I'm reading it is because I lived with the reality of a nuclear war ever since I'm five years old. And as I said in the last sentence, hospitals and madhouses are filled with people who have such visions. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. Welcome back to the Savage Nation. We're all sitting here wondering what to think and what to do next with Kim Jong mentally ill on threatening the United States of America and with Trump now saying to him, shut your big fat mouth or you're going to be hit with a weapon the world has never seen. And I've gone back to a novel I wrote in the, in the 1980s entitled The Survivor. Again, it is on Kindle. It's, an inco it's not a finished novel, but I'm reading from it. I guess it's about the sailboat, The Survivor, and this family that was preparing for something like this, what happens when a, an actual nuclear attack occurs off Honolulu and then Nevada. So let me continue for a few pages. Again, if you want to pick it up, it's on michaelsavage.com or on Kindle. Uh, I'm not going to get rich from it, but I researched this very, very carefully. So listen, if you're a sailor, tell me how well I did. Survivor was pitched down so far by the force of the first series of waves that her stern was out of the sea as was half her keel. Almost at once the reverse. Now her bow shot up so high to the perpendicular that her rear mast was half submerged. Simultaneously, the great wooden hull was tested by a series of lateral twists that would have broken anything less than the four-inch spruce ribs the builder had carefully fitted to the owner's specifications. As they were thrown about the cabin like so much flotsam and jetsam, Mac Williams strangely thought not about the safety of his family, but of his days when survival was being built. He remembered selecting the wood tree by tree as they sat in the curing shed of Chris Youngblood's boat work, Sitka Spruce, long renowned for its durability, was now being tested for its inherent capability of withstanding the tremendous forces of the nuclear tossed seas. Mac Williams had early on decided to forego even the best fiberglass. Not only was wood able to withstand the seas better over a longer period of time, but in the years to follow the end of technology, a good hardwood tree in the tropics could be cut, cured, and crafted to repair any damage 
whereas fiberglass repair would be impossible in a non-electro-technological world. Remember, it was written in the 80s. The beams grimaced. You could hear them fighting for their lives. From the cellular level on up, the wood struggled against her sister of nature, the sea. Oh, boy, this is pretty good writing. I'm going to you true, so... Let me go on. The rugged skipper had once been in a typhoon off the coast of Barcelona on the way to Ibiza. There, when he was 18 years old and knocking about Europe with his first wife, Kate, he had become so sick in the storm that he thought he saw the angel of death. This now solid man had, as a beginner on the road of strength, actually so lost his center that he called for a burly desk, deck steward to hold him over the rail as he threw up, on the, as he threw up over the rail. As the hairy sailor held the young Mac Williams in his iron-like arms, the sick passenger thought not of his loss of control, but about the waiting clean berth below. Just before his sickness forced its way out and over the side, just then, a huge and looming pterodactyl-like shadow, hooded like a racist clans person, the size of three ships, stood end to end, offered to take the boy man from his suffering. He had decided after that experience to grow tough to life's blows. He would in- insulate himself lift weights, study martial arts, practice the mystic sense of detachment known to the fiercest Eastern warriors. In short, he would not cave in again under pressure. But as the survivor fought for safe passage through this thermonuclear storm of water and fire, the grown man was tested more profoundly than in that Mediterranean melee. Now the safety of his children and his young wife depended on his skills and on his visionary paranoid preparations of the preceding years. Did he build her strong enough? Would they who he loved survive the inhuman pounding? And if they did, would he be able to pilot across 3,000 plus miles of ocean to the relative safety of life among a people not so savage as one willing to destroy the world to prove an ideological point? And as the father wondered, so did his sons. Mark the unpredictable boy was luckier than the others. Caught in the forward cabin where the dog was when the circle of water hit, he was knocked unconscious almost at once when his head struck hard but not fatally against the mast which traveled right through the yacht into the bilge. John, the older boy, felt something like his father had as a youth back on that ship in the stormy Mediterranean. He wasn't sick yet, but he felt sure they were all going to die. He began to yell in a hopelessly unpredictable twisting hole. Dad, Dad, we're going to die. We're going to die. Please help me. Help me. I'm scared. Please don't let me die. Mac Williams tried to go for his panicky son, but found he could not. His arm was trapped between the settee and the chart table, which had collapsed when the survivor came hard bow up. Johnny, he yelled loudly. Hold on. We'll be okay. Don't let go. We're going to make it. Hold on, Johnny. Hold on. Galen had been thrown out of her husband's arms onto the floorboards. By grabbing the thick maroon foam-insulated tufted full-length cushion, she had spared herself serious injury. Fighting the turbulent forces and gripping tightly from place to place with the almost superhuman strength known to come to us in such emergencies, the athletic woman crawled to Mac Williams. Working with her adrenaline and God knows what else her blood produced, she pried the man's arm free from the wooden jaws. Using a spare rod as lever in the front of the berth as a fulcrum, the chart table groaned and cracked slightly as the woman broke them loose. Then, without a word but a mutual signal of their eyes, they slowly made her way to the screaming boy. Well, I don't know if I should stop here or go on. You want me to continue? Buddy needs to know. Well, I have only three minutes left of the show, and I guess I should continue this from the survivor. The fireball that would surely have burned the yacht beyond usefulness, even 100 miles offshore, was made impotent by the circle of water that engulfed Survivor. As the storm passed, the yacht was found intact. Her main mast was gone, as were her forward sails and rigging. But the mizzen mast, smaller, remained. Pointing as it did to the sky, you would say if you saw it then, it was a symbol of defiance. The Avon life raft was also ruined. In falling, the huge tree of a mast broke the raft's housing in two. The rubber boat and its neatly packaged survival tools and supplies tossed to the reckless gray waves, but the family lived. Around them for hundreds of miles, the sky was a dark and purple. Endless thunder roared, the booming shock shaking them all to their very bowels. It was a man-made hell on earth. But if Mac Williams handled things just right, and if their luck was any good, they just might make it to the southern hemisphere, which had been spared this insane deluge, and find themselves in the islands where they would try to start anew. I will, I will pause right there, because the rest you can read yourself. It's in my unfinished novel, The Survivor, on Kindle, which I'm linking up on michaelsavage.com, and it was researched very carefully just for a time like this. Let's listen again to Donald Trump's statement today, which triggered all of this on The Savage Nation. They will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. He has been very threatening uh, beyond a normal statement. 
And as I said, they will be met with fire, fury, and frankly, power, the likes of which this world has never seen before. Thank you. What would you like Trump to do? Apologize? What would you like him to do? Pull an Obama and talk about race relations and attack the police while going on vacations with the millionaires and billionaires he lambasts? He's doing what has to be done as commander in chief. At the end of the day, the buck stops there. What would you expect Trump to do with madman Kim Jong mentally ill on continuing to threaten the United States of America? Never forget what Kim Jong mentally ill on did after the sanctions were imposed uh, over the weekend. He said America will pay for it a thousandfold. Now North Korea is threatening us. China, meanwhile, is engaging in war games. Russia just said today, everyone calm down. I guess Putin's busy wrestling tiger somewhere. Russia downplays North Korea's saber-rattling, tells the U.S. to be prudent. Oh, it wasn't, it wasn't Putin. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov emphasized that North Korea always complains about sanctions and not to overreact. Okay, well, I guess now maybe the leftists will like Lavrov. Who knows? Maybe they won't like Lavrov. Maybe they want a, a good nuclear war. So how do you think this is going to end? We don't know how this is going to end. We all want peace, but you cannot have peace when you have a Hitler. As we learned in Hitler's time, had he been stopped at Munich, we wouldn't have had World War II, and nine million people wouldn't have been put into the gas chambers. And if you think there aren't people suffering today in North Korea, you're mistaken. This is the Savage Nation. Thank you for listening. God bless America, and God bless Donald Trump. I'll be right back tomorrow. Savage.